the current pan-European legal framework solution help with your aims and avoid hazards in your company? How can you make the perfect round and get to the 19th hole relaxed in today's credit management sector? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome avid golf player and current CEO at Hugh J. Ward & Co. Solicitors, Hugh Ward. Thank you. say that's quite an introduction. Um, most of my golf, however, is bad golf, but it was great to get an opportunity to play with uh, Miguel uh, Jimenez. I don't know uh, if any of you are golfers here, but if you know Miguel Jimenez, he goes, uh, he's 51, he goes with his trademark ponytail, uh, he likes uh, lots of red wine, uh, Rioja, and big Cuban cigars. Uh, so he's not your typical Tiger Woods or Rory McIlroy, he's the other end of the, the spectrum. However, he is a fantastic athlete. So he really has got that uh, life balance sorted out. And when I got an opportunity to play with him, um, I was delighted. Uh, but unfortunately, my golf didn't live up to that. I could drink the wine and smoke the cigars, but not play his golf. Um, I want to talk to you today about uh, pan-European legal enforcement. Um, there is quite a lot in the subject matter, uh, but before I get into it, I'd like to just go through the history of uh, how I got to where I am and what our brand is. Uh, as, as was said yesterday, the brand is, is very important, and my, my brand will be the go-to firm for pan-European legal enforcement. That's what we do. How did I get there? Um, I am a member of the IICM, which is the Irish Institute of Credit Management, which has been around for about 40 years in Ireland. Uh, so they have a lot of history uh, and they put a lot of time into education and training uh, and, and whatnot. Uh, and Frank, uh, who's here today, has been very instrumental in developing all that into uh, best practice. Uh, so I'll be on the technical committee and be involved with the education committee uh, and very much involved with best practice as well. Um, developed out of that then uh, we got talking to Mark uh, and Mark's, um, at Mark's suggestion we looked at uh, best practice in, in Europe and particularly I looked at uh, what we could do from a, a legal training best practice point of view. So I have a project ongoing at the moment where we're looking at each uh, of the member states and there's 28 of them so it's quite a, a large project um, and there is, we've done about five or six of them to date. Uh, but at the end of that project, we will have uh, the uh, local enforcement uh, laws. Uh, we will then uh, marry that with the harmonization of the uh, European legal enforcement laws uh, that are changing every year. So it's important to have uh, those two aspects. Uh, I qualified in, in America in the uh, late 80s as a lawyer uh, after I qualified in Ireland. And the federal and state system over there is, is really indicative of what, what Europe is becoming, although it's not going to be a federal uh, state and there's a lot of differences, but from a legal uh, point of view, uh, you, when you're qualifying you do a state exam, uh, but you also do a federal exam as well. Uh, so, so it is in Europe, we have European legislation um, and we also have local state legislation. And I'll show you in the presentation how that all works together. <coughs> So, um, without further ado, I'd like to uh, go into the presentation, first of all, with a question. Uh, my question is, um, what percentage of your bad debt do you currently uh, send for legal enforcement? Is it 0%, 10%, 25%, 50% or more? I know this, this takes a little bit of time, so... Uh, I came up with a joke to tell you. Well, it's not really a joke, it's just... Um, uh, what is the difference between a credit manager and a solicitor? Um, and the answer is um, not very much because one is accused sometimes uh, of sales prevention and the other is accused sometimes of business prevention. <laughs> so we, of, we often get clients coming in and say we want the contract on one page. Um, it must be on one page because if it goes over one page and nobody's going to read it, etc, etc. But then when the shit hits the van later on, uh, they say contracts are pulled out of the drawer and everybody's looking at where's the term that covers whatever. And as you know, if you get your credit decisions wrong, um, they'll come to you looking for answers as to why did you allow that uh, happen in the first place. Uh, I suppose we're all involved really in, in risk management at the end of the day. So there we are, 10% uh, uh, 
clear winner at 66%. Um, but it's interesting that 18% uh, don't send anything out legal. Um, so um, let's go through the, uh, uh, the presentation. Um, and hopefully at the end of the presentation, you'll see reasons why uh, you should, probably should send some of your, um, some of your bad debts to legal. I suppose one of the reasons you mightn't is cost. Um, the second is you don't get any result at the end of it, any tangible result. Um, and there are two things that I'm trying to change. Um, it is, it has a place in the enforcement process. Uh, it's not uh, the beyond and, and all of everything, but it has a place within the process. Um, and I think if the message is out there that you don't litigate against uh, individuals or companies, uh, you will be seen as a soft touch. Uh, with social media and the way things are uh, communicated these days, that message will go around very quickly and will affect you. Uh, so before litigating, uh, you must, just a few basics, you must know the name and address of the person you want to sue, whether they have uh, assets to uh, pay your claim, uh, otherwise there's little point in litigating. I think this is one of the big problems. Uh, a lot of people litigate on the wrong cases. They don't do the groundwork uh, at the very beginning uh, to ensure that at the end there is an actual asset to, to enforce against. <coughs> when you get a court judgment, it basically means that the uh, time for dispute is over. Uh, a court somewhere has said the money is due and that's the end of it. Now there are certain circumstances where that can be challenged but they're very, very limited. So if you have a judgment and you go to enforce that, and somebody says, you know what, I don't owe the money, uh, you can ignore that basically uh, and go and enforce it. So that's one of the main reasons why you get judgments. But legal action has adverse consequences for your, for your customer base. <clears throat> Usually, uh, but not always, the relationship with your customer has to deteriorate to such an extent uh, that you have to take legal action in the first place. And that's not a good place to be in. But do you want to be doing business with people who are not going to pay you anyway? And uh, that's not good <coughs> business. Uh, so the EU has agreed certain procedures that simplify and speed up cross-border cases. The rules make it easier to enforce the claims. In 2013, the EU Commission came to me and they asked me to do a project across Europe. It was a two-year project. And I was asked to talk uh, in the various member states. Uh, I couldn't do them all because I do have a day job. I couldn't do 28 of them, but I did uh, five or six. Uh, I spoke in Latvia, Cyprus, Malta, Bulgaria, Hungary, uh, Ireland. And the, the topic really was um, contract construction and enforcement across border. And it was for SMEs. So the EU at commission level have uh, on their radar uh, cross-border enforcement and cross-border business. Um, and really what I hope to do today is bring up the data in relation to all that. So the first thing you have to decide is which court you're actually going to litigate in. Um, a recent regulation which passed on the 10th of January 2015 uh, replaced Brussels 1. And this set out the rules uh, which courts should uh, hear cross-border cases. The recast regulation uh, also applies to jurisdictions regarding non-EU residents. It abolishes formalities for recognition of judgments and simplifies the procedure for a court chosen by the parties. It uh, applies to legal proceedings instituted uh, to authentic instruments formally drawn up, are registered and court settlements approved or concluded on or after the 10th of January 2015. So if there's anything before this, it's going to be Brussels 1 that governs it, which is the current, which was the, the, the old regulation. So, so how does this work? And actually this applies in Denmark. If you're familiar with any of the EU uh, legislation, you probably know that Denmark is frequently uh, somebody that doesn't uh, partake in a lot of it. But procedures that are available uh, are one in a national court. So you're going to sue in your own court, first of all. And then you've got the European Enforcement Order, the European Order for Payment, and the Small Claims Procedures. Now there's quite a lot in this uh, presentation, so I'm going to skip through some of it. But if you have any questions in relation to that aspect that I skip through, uh, please feel free to, to contact me. Uh, I also have a number of case studies that I can go through with you also, but I won't go into them now. I want to get into uh, proceedings in your national court first of all. So these proceedings are determined by Regulation 1215, 
2012, which sets out the rules for deciding which, which courts should hear a cross-border case. It is essential that you have to know where to initiate legal proceedings. We've been involved in cases where the main dispute was where do you litigate? Uh, the Swiss government asked us to, to sue a major airline uh, for non-payment of uh, certain charges, airport charges, which ran into the millions. And a lot of the argument was around which court. Uh, and they were, and this won't take a genius to work this out, they were an Irish registered uh, headquartered major airline, but the charges were in uh, Switzerland. Um, and um, they argued that the litigation should happen in Switzerland as opposed to Ireland. And we obviously argued that it should be in Ireland and, and we won that particular jurisdictional battle. But it just emphasizes the point that you need to know which court uh, to litigate in. And your contract will have a lot to do with that, where you choose the jurisdiction in your contract. You've got to be aware that the legal proceedings in each uh, member state, that the costs involved will uh, vary greatly. So this is one of the things that you need to consider as to whether you're going to start legal action or not. Look at the costs involved, first of all, uh, and make sure that it is economically viable to do that. Um, as I said, in, the, in your terms and conditions, you can have clauses which cover the general jurisdictional rules, special jurisdictional, exclusive jurisdictional, and whether there's conflicts of law or not. So typically you want to put a jurisdiction in your case that will actually favor you. Your other side will want to put a jurisdiction in, in, the, in the contract, sorry, that will uh, favor them. So there's a little bit of uh, negotiation to go on there. Um, but the main objective of this regulation really is to uh, simplify the procedure. And I think the EU actually have done quite a good job in relation to that. They have made the, the procedure much easier to enforce your judgments in different uh, cross-border jurisdictions. So what you do is you obtain your judgment in the national court within the EU. And then Article 41 of the regulation states that for the enforcement of judgments given in another member state, they're governed by the law of the member state addressed. And also for the enforcement of those judgments, it goes on to say that they'll be enforced by way of the enforcement rules that govern the country that you're enforcing in, the member state that you're enforcing in. So you need to be aware of those rules. And I've got a couple of uh, examples later on what the rules are in Ireland, but you can imagine that each of the member states have different rules of enforcement and different costs in relation to enforcement. So, uh, uh, what do you need to do, um, some practical stuff in relation to get that enforcement going? You need to give a copy of the judgment which satisfies the conditions necessary to establish its authenticity. authenticity. So basically what that means is you want the, the court that you want to enforce uh, with needs to know that the judgment you have is actually a, a, a good judgment. Uh, the certificate of enforceability issued pursuant to Article 53 certifying that the judgment is enforceable and containing an extract of the judgment as well. So these are kind of procedures that you must go through to be able to enforce. Um, <clears throat> whether there is a judgment given in a member state orders a provisional and or a protective certificate, the applicant shall provide the competent enforcement authority with a copy of the judgment, the certificate issued under Article 53, um, where the measure was ordered without the defendant being summoned to appear, proof of service. You'll note that uh, a lot of the argument uh, around uh, being able to enforce judgment is around proof of service, and particularly if there's no defence put in. So what the court wants to see is, has the other party been properly served with the, the papers? It's very, very simple, but it actually can take up quite a lot of time and effort and cost and expense trying to prove that if you don't have it at the, the very beginning. So there are a number of defences against recognition in this way, contrary to public policy, or where a judgment was granted in default of appearance, and a few other defences, so you need to be aware of that as well. Um, so moving on then to the uh, European Order for Payment. Um, this is one of the, uh, the, the, the orders that actually work within the EU. Um, so it's based on uh, EU regulation number 1896 of 2006. In this alternative to, uh, to the procedure which can be carried out nationally, no court order for payment in the classical sense is applied for, but you apply for a European payment order. So it's actually the European payment order that you apply for in this case. 
The advantage of this procedure is its uh, expedience. Uh, only one application is necessary, and the order can also be enforced in other EU member states, with the exception of Denmark, of course. The procedure for such an application is that a cross-border legal matter must be in existence. So that's the kind of key difference uh, between proceeding in a national court and then enforcing and getting an order for payment and using that order to enforce. There must be a cross-border legal matter involved. So this requirement is fulfilled when at least one of the parties has their usual residence or domicile in another uh, EU member state other than the member state of the court to which the case is referred. So that's the cross-border definition. Uh, there's also a European small claims procedure, which I won't go into detail here, but I think it is uh, indicative of the way that um, the EU Commission is thinking in relation to uh, making it easy to litigate across borders. So from that point of view, it is interesting. Uh, its limit at the moment is 2,000 euros, uh, but they intend to move that up to 10,000 euros very soon. Um, so it's important to consider that the European Order for Payment procedure only applies if the monetary claim is undisputed and due. Uh, if the debtor lodges an objection to the claim uh, within a particular time limit, it will then be uh, referred to the, the normal courts for litigation and uh, resolution. So the procedure is very simple. To apply for a European Order for Payment, a standardized form must be completed. It's codified in order to simplify the same to account for possible language barriers. So it's a relevant form A. That's the, there's a standard form uh, that you fill out. It's very, very straightforward, um, and it uh, takes account of the different languages that might be involved as well. Um, so it, the actual language that you use is the, uh, the language of the EU country in which the application is submitted. Um, so um, the the actual member state that you use is generally the member state in which the respondent is domiciled. And the, there is a website which tells you uh, which, which uh, you should use. But once submitted, the application is reviewed for completeness by the competent court. If necessary, they'll ask you for additional information. Um, and the court will examine your application. And if you've filled in the form correctly and reply to all requests for further information, the court will issue an order within 30 days. So it's quite fast as well. Uh, it doesn't uh, check the information provided. Um, as I say, you get your order within 30 days uh, and it's then served on the defendant by the court who can either pay or contest the amount. He has 30 days to lodge, uh, the defendant has 30 days to lodge a uh, statement of opposition and if this happens, Again, that's, that's uh, then uh, sent to the National Court for determination. If he doesn't challenge it, uh, the European Order for Payments automatically becomes legal and enforceable in all states. So you don't have to do anything else in any of the member states that there may be assets that you're following. I won't talk too much about the European Small Claims Procedure, except to say that there is an intention to increase it to 10,000. Uh, euros. Um, in addition to that, there is a, a number of um, procedural issues that the small claims uh, procedure uh, is using currently, uh, which I think will be used in the future for larger sums. So, uh, for instance, there's no requirement, and this, this, this is on the way and isn't here yet, but there will be no requirement for you to actually physically turn up in court and they will accept uh, video attendance uh, at the court. So that saves in cost. And a lot of these, a lot of these uh, things that they've done with the European Small Claims is to save costs and make it easy for people to actually litigate. So again, it's a Form A, and again, you've got the 30 days. Uh, a lot of the procedures are exactly the same. The only real difference is that there's no uh, monetary uh, limit um, outside of the Small Claims. The Small Claims 2,000 at the moment, going to 10,000. So you go through the procedure, there may be a request for additional uh, information from the court. Um, but once the court uh, has issued a judgment in the applicant's favour, uh, then you ask the court to fill out a Form D as an official confirmation. And that really is your piece of paper that allows you to enforce uh, across all member states. 
And you're, they're also required to give you assistance in filling this out as well. So they try to make it as easy as possible uh, to be able to do this. The idea is to strengthen the position of consumers and businesses in low-value cross-border disputes. Uh, and that ceiling, uh, when it's raised to, to 10,000, will benefit SMEs as it will apply to about 50% of SME claims, uh, which is quite, uh, quite good. Um, they've got to widen the definition of what is a cross-border case. They're going to cap the fees at 10% of the value of the claim. They're going to cut paperwork and travel costs, which I mentioned earlier, uh, so that they're going to allow for uh, claims online. Email will be legally valid means of communication and tele and video conferencing will be allowed instead of actually physically having to appear in the court. That was the airport charges case I referred to earlier. Um, I just want to talk a bit about the recast of the European Insolvency Regulation. <clears throat> On May uh, 2015, the European Parliament adopted a recast regulation. <clears throat> so that's that's not, most of the provisions are not going to become operational until about 2017. But it's something that you need to keep uh, in your minds in relation to how uh, the insolvency uh, regime is going to work throughout Europe. The recast will extend the existing regulation scope to proceedings aimed at giving the debtor a second chance, strengthen the current jurisdictional framework, improve the coordination among insolvency proceedings, um, and strike a better balance between efficient insolvency administration and protection of local creditors. They reinforce the publicity of the proceedings by compelling member states to provide for insolvency registers and providing for the interconnection of national registers. So for the DMVs and experience and company watches, it's going to be very important, uh, these new registers uh, and what you look at to see if you can do business with a company and you can extend credit to a company. They also deal with the management of multiple insolvency proceedings across the member states, which is a, which is a real problem at the moment. So you, currently you can have uh, insolvency proceedings going on in various member states against companies, uh, very complex company structures. In relation to individuals, uh, we've seen uh, during the crash that um, there was a lot of jurisdiction and forum shopping going on. To give you an example, <coughs> a lot of individuals in Ireland <coughs> moved to the UK uh, because bankruptcy has a one year, year, one year term in the UK, whereas in Ireland at the time it had a 12 year term. So obviously if you went into the UK, applied for bankruptcy, you'd be discharged of your debts within 12 months, whereas in Ireland it was 12 years. <coughs> this has changed in the meantime, uh, Ireland has had three years, but there's still a good reason why you would go to the UK uh, to make use of that. <coughs> Again, Denmark has opted out, just to be aware of that. <laughs> so just in relation to timelines, uh, the majority of the provisions apply from 26 of June 2017. The establishment of the National Insolvency Register is coming to force in 26 of June 2018. Uh, and the EU interconnected register by June 2019. So some future dates uh, to keep in mind. They, this, does, this legislation doesn't have to be adopted by the member states, so it's in effect from those dates uh, without any other legislation going on or anything else going on. So just moving on from that, and I know there's a lot of information here. Uh, I'm glad that you had your coffee because it gave you that extra boost to actually stay awake during the presentation. But um, I just wanted to give you a comparison between the different systems that traditionally have grown up throughout Europe. Um, uh, and I'm about to, I'm more than 50% way through my presentation, you might have to hear at this stage. Uh, centralized enforcement system, this happens in Northern Ireland, for instance, uh, and in Sweden, uh, where the government basically has set up an enforcement office. Um, when you want to enforce something there, you apply to the office, and the office does the enforcement in the way they want to do it. Uh, it's effective. Um, it's more effective uh, in Northern Ireland, that system, than what's happening in, in the Republic of Ireland at the moment. Um, but in Sweden, uh, it's an extremely efficient uh, method. 75 to 80% of enforcements are completed in under three months, which is unheard of. The main reason, uh, I believe, for that is the ability to access relevant, up-to-date information. So in Sweden, 
uh, they can look at the National Tax Board and everything else, basically, there's, it's all connected and all that information is available uh, and they get good results. You've got to balance that against the privacy of the individual uh, and find some kind of um, uh, level playing field that everybody's comfortable with. Um, in, our, in England and Wales and Ireland, we have a court-based enforcement system. So the court makes the enforcement order and they're executed by a mixture of private and public officers. So you've got things like the seizure and sale of debtors' goods. You've got attachment of earnings mechanism, uh, which is not currently available in Ireland. However, the legislation changed about one month ago to say that uh, it will be available in Ireland as soon as the courts decide to put the relevant rules in place, which hasn't happened yet. So it's in legislation, but it's not effective in Ireland yet. We expect that to happen within the next month or so. Um, and that replaced what used to be available up to that period of one month ago, which was committal to prison for non-payment. Um, so people were still being committed to prison uh, for non-payment of debt. Uh, technically, they were being committed to prison for contempt of court as opposed to non-payment of debt, but it was still going on. Uh, with a stupid system because somebody's in prison, they're not going to be able to pay you, and it didn't really achieve any results whatsoever, but it was a kind of a throwback to a different year. Um, in general, the enforcement is seen as inefficient mainly due to the lack of information. That, that is changing. There are new registers and people after the crash are kind of waking up to the fact that, look, if we're going to have a, a grown-up conversation about extending credit and being able to retrieve that credit if things go wrong, we need to make certain information available, and that's beginning to happen. Uh, in Austria, uh, it's, there's an example of a court-based system which is efficient. Under 10,000 uh, credit can apply online for a payment order, and it's basically efficient due to the online enforcement application system and wire powers of enforcing court to obtain the information. Because the information is, is the key, as, as you all know. Um, the privatized enforcement in France, enforcement is carried out without judicial intervention. It's a special enforcement judge who looks after disputes in relation to that. And only authorized enforcement agents called, uh, I don't know if my French is good, Lucia de Justice, uh, can carry out the enforcement itself. And they can request the public prosecutor to get involved. So it's a completely different system. Um, so the EU sees uh, that difficulties in cross border debt recovery is a bar to the EU market as a result of the various complicated enforcement regi regimes across the member states. Key is information about the debtor assets. The primary factor for efficiency of enforcement procedures is information on the debtors, financial position, and registers such as population registers, tax, social insurance, police records, are really a matter for national public policy. You know, how far does the does member state want to go in relation to releasing the citizens' information? To, to give you an example, um, when the Troika came to Ireland, uh, they asked us during, during our bailout, uh, they asked us to do certain things. And one of the things they asked us to do was set up a water authority. And uh, this has been extremely controversial. Uh, people understand why you have to pay for water, but it probably was the last thing that kind of broke the camel's back, if you like. Uh, and there's a huge uh, movement of people who don't want to pay for water. So these are, these are individuals who can afford to pay for it, but won't pay for it on a mass scale. So. This is actually a huge challenge for the state with an election coming up next year. How do they deal with that? Uh, so they got so so it's gone through different ways um, uh, during the, the the period of time of how they would deal with it, and they they reckoned committal was available at the time that they couldn't put you know more than fifty percent of the country in jail because they didn't have enough jails and it wouldn't work anyway. Um, and that really is why they brought in attachment of earnings. Uh, because uh, that would be deducted at source uh, in relation to the non-payment of the charge for somebody who can't afford to pay uh, once, that's, once the decision uh, you know, uh, is taken as to whether it's a uh, can pay or won't pay. Um, but that, that, is, you know, that is the first time I've seen a kind of a national mass demonstration of non-payment. Uh, so there's got to be a mechanism in each of the member states if that does happen uh, for the wrong reason uh, to be able to overcome that. Uh, and it's very interesting to see it, you know, from an academic point of view, and everybody in Ireland has very, very strong views on this, uh, but it's very interesting to see how the state reacted to that. 
Um, the primary factor for efficiency enforcement, yeah, is, is the information and financial uh, position. I'm just going to finish up with uh, some information in relation to what happens in Ireland currently. And just as an example of what can go on in the member state for the enforcement, and as I've said, the enforcement procedures could change from uh, member state to member state. So in Ireland, registration of the judgment in the High Court, this results <coughs> to this results in the actual publication of the judgment. So what happens to the Gazette will go in and pick up the fact that the judgment has been registered uh, and publish that. However, I would say only about 20% of judgments are registered in the High Court. So there's a, there's a gap there of about 80% of unregistered, what we call unregistered judgments that are not published. And, you know, attempts have been made to publish them through the years, but the problem is that there's no way of knowing whether they've been satisfied at some stage. Uh, between actually the judgment not being obtained and the publication. So you can imagine that would be, uh, make a lot of lawyers happy if, if they have to go in and litigate uh, in, in that, those circumstances. Uh, the sheriff, uh, we use sheriffs, uh, which are uh, officers of the state. Uh, they have day jobs and they're called county registrars, so they're the person who sits in front of the judge and then in the evening they go out and try and collect goods, with the exception of Dublin and Cork. Um, but the judgment can be sent to the sheriff for execution against goods, so they try and seize goods and sell it. Examination, that's where somebody basically is taken uh, into court on summons and they're examined as to their means, cross-examined as to the means, their income, uh, their outgoings, their expenditure and so on. Now, um, the judge at the end of that will say uh, you're uh, able, you have the ability to actually pay 200 euros a month or whatever it might be, but there's an installment order that came out at the very end of that. In the past, if you didn't actually pay that installment order, you were committed to prison, and that's where the committal process came from. So it was a, it was a judge who decided you'd pay 200 a month, but because you didn't do that, you were then in contempt of that order, and then you were sent to prison, but that's just been abolished as a thing. Bankruptcy, you talked about already. So bankruptcy has gone from 12 years down to three years, and there's talk about going down to one year. And a lot of people are still going to the UK, and there's been a lot of litigation uh, in relation to that, uh, as to whether they have domicile there or not, uh, before they apply for bank bankruptcy. Garnishee orders, uh, this is where you're able to uh, take an order against somebody who owes your debtor uh, money, and have uh, the debtor's debtor, if you like, pay you directly. So that's another method of enforcement. Um, receiver by way of equitable execution and the court can appoint a receiver to collect in rents for instance from a property where the owner is diverting those rents away from you as a creditor and pay, pay you directly and judge of mortgages is where you take a judgment and you convert that into a mortgage on a property uh, so that your unsecured debt then becomes a secured debt and under our new insolvency uh, legislation uh, that becomes a secure debt in that, in that payout also. So, I'll ask you another question, and this is really at the end of, and uh, hopefully there'll be a different result, but who knows. Uh, what percentage of your bad debt uh, would you propose uh, in the future uh, to send out for a litigation? <laughs> okay, well that's a good result, I think. <clears throat> um, I think, you know, if, 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 if as a result of what I've said, less of you want to send uh, your litigation out for your, your bad debt out for litigation, uh, then I think you need to come and talk to me after the, uh, the lecture, <laughs> because uh, uh, the main message that will go out is that you're not going to litigate. Um, so if you're not going to litigate, uh, you will be seen as a soft touch and your competitors will be getting paid and at the end of the day, it may take a little while, you won't get paid. Um, so we quickly move on from that. <clears throat> um, so uh, I think all I need to do is conclude what I've been trying to say and trying to communicate to you. Um, whatever the facts of the case are will determine which procedure you should adopt. So, you've got to look at the facts of each case. Is there an asset there? Uh, do you know that the individual is there? Can you serve them? Can you get your judgment? Can you enforce? And can you get that asset sold to pay your, your debt? 
Um, European order for payments is uncontested claims. There's no maximum value. Uh, for small claims procedure, it's anything under 2K. And I suppose, as, as a follow-on to the question, um, what I propose to do is set up, and I'll leave this uh, with you, is set up an academy, online academy, which will give you information uh, in relation to the, all these procedures and the complications. So if at some stage uh, somebody comes in and says, well, why aren't you litigating any of, your, any of the bad debt? Um, please pick up the phone to me um, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to give you some uh, relevant information. Thank you very much. I, I'm available to take questions uh, now or later. Thank you. Not a question, but I can probably cope without a microphone. It's just an anecdote based on this. I live in Slovakia, I work in Slovakia. I have just concluded a small claims, a small uh, claims court procedure here in Slovakia. It's taken 10 years to reach a judgment and he's now gone to appeal. <laughs> so whether I'll ever get money is another question. That was pretty. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I'm hoping to change. I mean, yeah. the, the, the view at the moment of legal, and you know, it's reflected in the answers, is it takes too long, it's too expensive, and I don't get a result at the end of it. Mm -hmm. So my, uh, I suppose, uh, mission, vision, whatever it may you want to call it, uh, is to make it relevant, to make it cost effective, uh, and, and to get a result, a tangible monetary result at the end of it. Um, so hopefully I can do that over the next couple of years. I do think the European legislation, the way it's developing, I mean, I'm not sure how the small claims procedure operated 10 years ago, but there is a lot of different, you know, there's quite a lot that they've done to it uh, since then. Uh, and you can see that they intend to do more. Um, you know, and, and, and the European Commission did spend quite a lot, um, quite a lot of budget, I suppose, in, in sending that, the, you know, me and that group of people around to the various member states to uh, to talk about the subject, um, you know, and uh, involved in that were people who were involved in actual real life businesses, you know, and their stories about problems they had. Um, one of the big messages that came out was lack of information, that they really didn't know the credit risk of doing business uh, with some with, a, with an SME outside of their their own member state. And I, I realize uh, there's quite a lot of large corporations here. Um, but, you know, looking at the actual um, debts that you're working with, you know, there's, I think, um, aggregated debts from 1,000 to several million, you know. So it is relevant in some way. Uh, it's just kind of figuring out which way it is relevant, where the relevance is. Any more questions, ladies and gentlemen? Well, in that case, thank you very, very, thank much, you very much. Thank you very much, yeah.